The tide goes out and the tide comes in on a regular basis. Right now when it comes to talking about marriage preparation, the tide is way, way out. But those with vision can see it turning, and when it turns, it will be aimed straight at us. I really believe that this applies to so much more than just marriage preparation. It applies to all applications of our Christian and Catholic faith. As one of the speakers was the super excellent teacher, Reg Craig, if any of you knew him. The only person in my life to admit that he could never figure me out. <laughs> Hearing him say that was one of the happiest moments of my life. <laughs> I have yet to figure myself out. I am still, you stole my thunder, I'm still a work in progress, like all of us. <laughs> this means that as I age, I have to do my best to grasp the concepts that were never even thought of when I attended and took part in those marriage courses back in 69 and 70. For example, it was unheard of in those days for couples to live together before marriage do other things together maybe, but then I never asked them, because that too would have been unthinkable in those days. Life was so different, so much different than it is now. Almost every couple went to Mass regularly, or in the case of mixed religion couples, there was still involvement in worship. Marriage was a serious sacrament of the Church, and this was one of the, most, of the important reasons for couples preparing well. I have to admit, though, that even way back then, it was like a six-week course, Thursday nights or whatever it was. The, the evening with the talk about the spiritual side of marriage was almost always the most poorly attended meeting. In those days, couples were very much, or very often much younger than they are today, and some of them, for some of them, even the subject of the birds and the bees needed to be addressed, and it was. We had Dr. John Savage as one of the most popular speakers, popular of all the speakers. Through, uh, we had him, I don't know how many years we had him speaking at the course, but he was very popular. In hindsight, we need to ask, why he was so popular? And Reg Craig, too. Why they were so popular? One evening, he told us all that in his home, his wife Margaret, and he taught their seven children uh, sex education from an early age. They taught them. Sometimes too much knowledge can backfire, as it did when one of the children was asked in school to name the capital of Saskatchewan, and she replied, Vagina. <laughs> <laughs> I know why Dr. Savage was so popular. It was because of something very simple. He talked openly about unmentionable things. Most people in those days, and well, you have to admit it's almost the same nowadays, we don't want to touch stuff that might be a privacy issue. And so we have marriages that are very unhappy because couples don't know what to say to each other or how to say it, even when they do know what it is. It's so much easier to just have a fight. Kids will never hear us. It's one that I, I've heard too often. And as I heard just within the last week or so from a friend who is married, making up is the best part of the fight. I'll take his word for it. <laughs> but isn't that line a bit like the line that so emphatically states that every now and then we need a good thunderstorm to clear the air? Yeah, my take on this. No, we don't. No, we don't. Not in the human air. Remember that wonderful old passage from the Old Testament where the prophet looked for God and did not find him in the thunderstorm or in the great storms that came around? He found him in the gen of breathless. But nowadays, like back then in the 1970s, I mean, not in the prophet's time, we don't talk about important things, and we really need to do that. I used to tell parents that I would regularly tell their kids that if they really want to get their parents, really get them, all they need to do is to announce that, first of all, I had sex with my girlfriend last night, and secondly, I'm never going to mess with you again. If you tell your parents these tidbits, they will be tongue-tied, because those are the two areas in our life that we do not know how to talk about. The spiritual and the sexual. That has to change. Especially when we're talking about preparing couples for marriage. And before you leave this room, you have to know, I never ever told a child to say that those things to his or her parents. 
but it's rather the parents to, to even think that I might have. <laughs> <laughs> when I sit and think, or when I'm driving around, and I'm thinking about how we're going to be of assistance for couples getting married, and we need to remember that nowadays most couples would gladly bypass any formal instructions relating to their future marriage, I realize that we also need to remember that it's us telling them they need preparation. Most of them are light years ahead of us in almost every aspect of what it means to be married, except for the big one, the sacramental, holy, and spiritual aspects of this wonderful institution. Many, if not most, of the couples who respond to our request, if we can call it this, that they make a marriage preparation course, already have jobs, mortgages, which mean a house together, even a home together, there's a big difference there. Many of them have children, and with the reality of second and third marriages, many of them have their own grandchildren in all their wedding ceremonies. What do we have to say to these folks? What can we say to these folks? Especially after we're the ones who tell them they must come and listen to us. We need to remember a couple other significant realities as we try to do what we are called to do in the interests of the integrity of the sacraments of our Holy Church. We need to remember that we live in what I call uh, a post-Eucharistic church in which roughly 90% of baptized Catholics simply stay away from Mass on Sunday. We come to church for baptisms, weddings, funerals, and for a lot of things. But Mass is a no And whatever we do, this fact will have a large bearing. Another major caution that we must take is the use of language. The language we speak here right now is not the language everyone else speaks. If we are to get a message across, then we need to do some language training ourselves. There's so much more that, uh, to what I could say to you right now, but I need you to hear that since I'm going to be the Episcopal Vicar Church with coming up with something val valuable by virtue of the fact that it will help complete and complement these couples' preparation for holy marriage, I need you to know that no one person could ever do that alone, for sure. We are talking about the vehicle that will carry these folks to heaven. What a responsibility we have taken on ourselves, or rather more properly expressed, what a task the good Lord has set before us. I invite anyone with vision enough to see that tide coming back in to join me as we do what we can with what we already have, even though we may never have used what we have to its potential. Now is the time to try our best to help others reach a potential they don't yet know they have within them. And uh, we frequently hear a statement that it takes a community to raise a child. And when I thought of that in my own life, I wrote down some things that I believe influenced me as a child in my community where I grew up. The things that I look back on was family, was school, was the parish church, was the neighbors, and was the friends that I grew up with around the community, both Catholic and not Catholic. All of these played a role in my life. Our pastor pushed for the school and we built it in St. Catherine's, Halifax. And it was wonderful because it was only two blocks away and I could sleep in another five minutes and still make it to school in time. <laughs> anyway, all those things went together for me as, as a child and uh, I look back uh, with a lot of fondness and have to say I had a happy child. And I had it because each one of those components were good to me. When I got ordained at St. Catherine's in the neighborhood, the neighbors who were not Catholic were just as interested in coming to the ordination as were my grandparents and other people who were still part of my life. 
they would say to me, we watched you grow up, and we want to be there for that celebration. And of course, we said, come on, the doors of the church are open. And we tried to send them an invitation. So, as life went on for me, I went to Resurrection College in Kitchener, Ontario, and not many people in the Maritimes even heard of that place. In fact, I was the only Maritimer in the home of the college. But as life went on, there was somebody else in that college, his name was Anthony Mancini. <laughs> Bishop Mancini came to the diocese, he looked at me and said, well, at least I know one person. <laughs> <laughs> I, at that time, was kind of thinking about retiring. <laughs> <laughs> you were thinking of doing that at Resurrection College, though, man. <laughs> I was thinking at 65, I was going to pack her in. But somebody uh, had other ideas, and I, I went beyond 65. Anyway, then I was asked at one point by Bishop Mancini if I would be Episcopal Vicar. A lot of my friends were surprised when that announcement came. <laughs> <laughs> Including me. <laughs> The annulment process is too long. And we need a thing that I would call a home gathering or a reunion. I'm still hoping that's going to happen. However, I keep reminding the bishop about that. <laughs> the other thing that doubts the questions where the law is sitting. We need a catechetical program where we're united. And here's where come the bishop never forgot that, but he needed somebody, he said, that's where you're interested. <laughs> <laughs> and here I go. Well, I have a great love for little children. I find them so honest, so open, so happy, and their willingness to, to gather around. I like tormenting them, and I like being with them. <laughs> and I have in the in the vestry at St. Rosalie, I have a bag of potato chips. And a lot of the kids know that. <laughs> <laughs> and they call it the chip room. <laughs> Not very liturgical, but very happy for them, right? <laughs> So they come in from time to time and they get a bag of chips. And of course I'm delighted to be able to do that. Why do I love little children? I love it because it perhaps was the happiest time of my life. And I look back upon it as, you know, for happiness and unity and friendship and brotherhood and love and new friends. That was the way it was for me and I wanted to be for them. There's a passage in scripture that always speaks loudly to me. It's the part where Christ challenges us to welcome little children. Now for parents, that's different than it is for me, I think. Because for them, the challenge is to give new life and to welcome that new life. But then, I can share from them on it. I can share in the care and the loving and the sharing of faith. And I become part of the families. 
or at least I hope I did. So, why did I say we need a United program? Well, when I first became a priest, and I'm not that far behind Joe and them in ordination, as far as age goes, I'm probably right with them. <laughs> but we had a United program, it was called Come to the Father. And we kind of stuck with that Canadian program for many years in the diocese. And then as time went on, we started branching off into different programs. And I think today we might have as many as four, five, six different programs across the diocese. And my thoughts are we should be one, teaching the same thing, or at least trying to. And I saw that as a challenge. I'd like for us to go back to. So we need a united program. We've got to teach the same message. We've got to share the resources that can come with that program. And we can have workshops. And in each of our parishes, if we're really uh, being truthful, we have strong teachers in some grades and we have weak teachers in other grades. But where we have the strong teachers, we can ask them to lead workshops for the other teachers in the other areas. I know in my parish, two of the teachers that I could easily ask, and know they do a great job. And you have the same thing to think. And we can share. So we can become a united diocese. Will we get there? We can if you jump on the way. We've got Sister with us, and we've got John as the resource people. We've got a workshop coming up and in August. Are we going to be ready for this fall? No. We're going to be ready for next fall, hopefully. Hopefully you'll join us. As the bishop said, with me? Yes. Away we go. Yes.